My name is Di Stiff and I'm the Collections Development Archivist at Surrey History Centre in Woking. Tracing lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and queer lives through historical sources can be incredibly challenging. Often there may only be negative stories and sources, such as court records, reflecting hostile legislation and society's attitude over time. Positive accounts of gay lives are very rare. Not every archive is lucky enough to have a Gentleman Jack diary, and rarely are collections placed with us purely because they relate to a known, documented LGBTQ plus person. Add to this the fact that homosexual activity was illegal until 1967, with earlier punishments ranging from hanging to the pillory and chemical rehabilitation, as in Alan Turing's case, and it's easy to understand why people would not always have openly advertised their sexuality. Yet, of course, throughout history, many LGBTQ plus people have made Surrey their home or have Surrey connections. And for over 10 years now, we have been revealing their stories from our unique archive and library collections. We have explored the lives of Dame Ethel Smythe, Dirk Bogard, Noel Coward, Edward Carpenter, Gwen Farrer and Nora Blaney, to name but a few. But the story I want to share with you here as part of this year's Pride in Surrey is that of Harry Daly an ordinary gay man who wasn't famous, but whose papers held at the History Centre reveal an extraordinary life. Harry, although born in Suffolk, spent much of his life in Dorking. Looking at the small collection of his notebooks and yellowed foolscap paper, written in with biro pen, you would think that there is nothing special about them, but behind their unremarkable appearance lies a remarkable story. For us, Harry's collection is one of those incredibly rare examples of someone leaving a frank memoir of their life as a gay man. This memoir, which is witty and beautifully written, transports you into his life. It was published posthumously in 1987 as This Small Cloud and resonates with LGBTQ plus people in particular. Harry had working class roots. He was born in Lowestoft, Suffolk, in 1901, the son of a fisherman. He writes that he had an idyllic childhood with his four siblings, Annie, Janet, Joseph and David. Tragically though, his father Joseph drowned in the Lowestoft Fleet shipping disaster of September 1911 and Harry left school to become an errand boy. Harry recalled his time at school. I didn't learn very much. I am grateful they taught me to read and write and I was always treated with kindness, even affection. But apart from the headmaster, who in any case did not actually teach us, I don't think they were very clever themselves. During the First World War, Harry's mother, Emily, feared Zeppelin raids and invasion. And in 1916, she moved the family to Number 7 Hart Gardens, a small terraced house near the centre of Dorking, the town where Annie, her eldest daughter, was already living. It took the family a good while to settle into their new life. But Harry writes, Our move to Dorking was the best thing that could have happened to us, although we did not realise it for some years. Harry admits that his lack of ambition led him to take the first real job that came along, a delivery boy for the select grocer's Kingham's. He delivered to the houses of the rich and famous around Dorking, including Lord Ashcombe at Denby's and the famous Edwardian hostess, the Honourable Mrs Greville at Polston Lacey. He met the Prime Minister, Bonner Law, the infamous Mary Stopes, and media magnate Lord Beaverbrook. Recalling customers in nearby Peaslake, Harry writes vividly of the suffragette Miss Wallace Dunlop, whom he described as impressive in tweeds and a no-nonsense manner, with her pretty niece and comparatively dim companion all painting on their easels at the edge of the sunlit common outside their cottage. Harry realised he was gay at an early age. He had always felt different, immersing himself in books, the theatre, classical music and art galleries. When family and neighbours tried to find him a sweetheart, he knew this was not what he wanted. He writes, Throughout my life, I have had a recurrent nightmare in which, having just been married, I leave my beautiful bride to the church door. At this point, I cry out in despair. Oh, what a bloody fool I am. And I wake, sweating, gradually realising that I have not really ruined two lives. 
In the early years of the 20th century, the legal situation for gay men in England was extremely unpleasant. Homosexual activity was illegal and the social and political response to it was stark. Punishment was quickly enforced and reputations were ruined. So in 1914, when Harry struck up a friendship with a young seaman called Nobby Clark, very soon rumours were spreading and whilst he saw nothing wrong in being gay, Harry was threatened with punishment and prison. He could not believe love and affection were things to be ashamed of. He viewed his relationships as only having done him good and perhaps naively saw no wrong in striking up close friendships with other men. Harry craved London cultural life and he joined the Metropolitan Police in 1925, working beats in Chiswick, Hammersmith and Wandsworth. It was not an obvious choice of career, especially as he describes himself as well below average plain common sense, sexually both innocent and deplorable, honourable if not exactly honest, trusting, truthful, romantic and sentimental to the point of sloppiness. He soon became aware that his sexuality was widely known among his colleagues and higher officers, but he stoically bore the jibes. Whether brave or naive, Harry never denied being gay, nor would he allow them to ride roughshod over him, but he felt the same prejudice that he had felt as a boy and he wished it would stop. Astonishingly, Harry's openness never affected his career. There is true irony in the fact that he was a gay man and a policeman enforcing the law, but was never himself arrested. Perhaps a key factor in avoiding recrimination lay in the fact that he was affable, gregarious and had a good sense of humour. He was full of optimism and self-belief and people were drawn to his easygoing manner. Harry could be vain, but he was also vulnerable. He was kind to the criminals he encountered, many of whom were simply petty thieves, poor and of the same class as him. He was also attracted to them, as well as his colleagues. Commenting on the fact that the 1920s depression had driven many middle-class public schoolboys to become policemen, Harry remarked that for the first time, the police were better looking than the criminals. Harry's life changed in 1925 when he met gay author J.R. Ackerley after being stationed in Hammersmith as a constable. P.N. Furbank, the freelance writer and critic who wrote the foreword to this small cloud, records, They met casually in the street early one morning, and by pleasant chance it turned out in conversation that Daly, who was an indefatigable theatre-goer, had seen a production of Ackerley's play The Prisoners of War at the Lyric Hammersmith. It initiated a long, indeed a lifelong, friendship, and quite soon, through Ackerley, Daly had become friendly with quite a number of Ackerley's literary and artistic acquaintances, amongst them Raymond Mortimer, Duncan Grant, Gerald Hurd, Lionel Charlton and E.M. Forster. Grant even painted Daly in 1930, and the portrait now hangs in the Guildhall Art Gallery, London. Harry's social life in the late 1920s and early 1930s was certainly lively and all-embracing. He also became friends with Edward Sackville West, Desmond Shaw Taylor and other figures in the literary and musical world. In 1926, as a peripheral member of the Bloomsbury set, Harry began a relationship with the Surrey author E.M. Forster, who was then living at Abinger. Forster found Harry worryingly indiscreet and was convinced that this indiscretion would get them all arrested. Their relationship ended in 1932. There were many parties where several men fell in love with Harry, but he was different, working class, self-taught, but with a love of culture. And he was attracted to what he describes as normal men, older, rougher and stronger than himself. However, his indiscretion meant that he fell out with the Bloomsbury set, which caused bitterness and resentment. Frustratingly, this fascinating and formative part of Harry's life isn't included in his memoirs, and although we do not know why, it is clear that Harry became disenchanted with the group but did not want to put it into print. Harry's friendship with Ackerley thankfully survived. Ackerley was then working for the BBC, and recognising Harry's easy style of storytelling, he persuaded him to make some radio broadcasts on the home service talking about his experiences on the beat and the criminal activity he encountered on London's streets. Incredibly, 
the Metropolitan Police gave permission and the first broadcast went out on the 25th of March 1929. Others followed, all subsequently published in the Listener magazine, which was edited by Ackerley. Later in the 1940s, Harry wrote a number of short stories and submitted them to Ackerley, but none were published. However, ultimately we have Ackerley to thank for this small cloud, as it was he who encouraged Harry to write his memoirs following his retirement from the police. The 1939 register, compiled as part of the National Identity Card Registration Initiative at the beginning of the Second World War, shows Harry recorded as a police sergeant, living at the police section house 40 Beak Street in Westminster, along with 83 colleagues. During the war, he witnessed the full horror of the Blitz, with dead bodies and destruction all around him. He recalls in his memoirs that friends and colleagues who enlisted in the services were killed almost as soon as they could be trained. Harry was traumatised by his wartime work and experiences. In 1944, Harry's beloved mother Emily died. In 1939, she and Harry's younger brother David had moved to Hillview, now 78 Pixon Lane, a cottage in Pixon, situated on the edge of Dorking. When Harry left the police in May 1950, he moved in with David, who was also gay, along with David's partner John. This is where Harry's memoir stops. Just short of retirement, Harry was employed as Master at Arms in the Merchant Navy. He faced the prospect of coming out to new friends, colleagues and superiors. Could he face the whispering, the sniggering, the leg pulling, the insults, the cold shoulder? Characteristically, he decided that yes, on the whole, he could bear all those things. The close of Harry's life was very quiet. Retiring from the Merchant Navy, Harry nursed his Siamese cat and gardened at his cottage. He also helped out for a time at Friends Provident, where he met John Coombs. John, who later became a book dealer, and his wife, were great friends with Harry and instrumental in preparing Harry's manuscript for publication. Harry suffered from diabetes and they visited him regularly at the end of his life whilst he was ill in Dorking Cottage Hospital. Harry died on the 12th of March 1971 and his ashes were scattered on Box Hill. Peter Parker, J.R. Ackerley's biographer, compiled the Dictionary of National Biography entry for Harry and of this small cloud he comments, this remarkable book is not only funny, touching and self-deprecatory, but it is an important social document. And so it is. For Surrey History Centre, from a millennia of records, it is the only existing manuscript memoir of a gay man that we hold. Without it, much of Harry's life would simply be invisible. We would have official sources like the census and civil registration information, but not his words, his thoughts or his emotions. And we are richer for it, for the unique insight it gives us into life as a gay man at a time when being so was dangerous and illegal. Reflecting on his life, Harry writes, My life has been delightful and given a chance by God or somebody of another life at the end of this, then I'd say without hesitation, same again, please. So much of the county's LGBTQ plus history is lost or undetectable, but we are committed to making it more visible and accessible. We want to add more biographical stories and research pages to our Exploring Surrey's Past website. Working with LGBTQ plus organisations and individuals and encouraging them to contribute to the archive is vital in helping us grow our collections and make them relevant to a wider audience. In preserving these records, we can ensure that Surrey's LGBTQ plus history is not forgotten or lost. If you have relevant material or would like to add a story of your own to the archive, we would be delighted to hear from you.